Chapter Nine of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I am not of a nature to be long overwhelmed. All that night and far into next day I lay upon Verwood, alternately sleeping and bewailing the chance which tossed me to and fro upon the restless ocean of time, and then I arose. I threw my arms round each in turn of those dear callous ones in the chapel, and pushed back the brambles from them, and wept a little, and told myself the pleasure store of life was now surely spent to the very last coin. Then, with a mighty effort, tore myself away. Again and again, while the smooth swell of the grassy mound under which the foundations of the long-destroyed Saxon homestead, with the little chapel by the rivulet, were in sight, I turned and turned, loath and sad, but no sooner had the leafy screen hid them than I set off and ran whither I knew not, nor cared. Indeed, I was so terribly drawn by that spot, so close in the meshes of its association, so thralled by the presence of the dust of all I had had to lose or live for, that I feared, if the best haste were not made, I should neither haste nor fly from that terribly sweet hillock of lamentations for ever. What could it matter where my wandering feet were turned? All the world was void and vapid, east and west alike indifferent to one so homeless. And thus I stalked on through glades and coppices for hours and days, with my chin upon my chest, and feeling marvellously cheap and lonely. But enough of this, never yet did i crave sympathy of any man why should i seem to seek it of you sceptical and remote there were those who appeared at that time to take compassion on me unasked and i remember the countrywomen at whose cottage doors i hesitated a moment yearning with pent-up affection over their curly-headed little ones added to the draught of water i begged such food as their slender stores provided one of these gave me a solid green forester's cape and jerkin another put shoes of leather upon my feet and a third robbed her husband's pegs to find me headwear and so through the gifts of their unspoken good will i came by degrees into the raiment of the time but nothing seemed to hide the inexpressible strangeness i began to carry about with me no sorry apparel no woodman's cap drawn over my brows no rustic clogs upon my wandering feet masked me for a moment from the awe and wonder of these good english people none of them dared to ask me a question how i came or where i went but everywhere it was the same they had but to look upon me and up they rose and in silence and drawn involuntarily by that stern history of mine they knew naught of they ministered to me according to their means the women dropped their courtesies and unasked unasking fed the grim and ragged stranger from their cleanest platter the men stood by and uncapped them to my threadbare russet and whole groups would watch spellbound upon the village mounds as i paced moodily away in course of time my grief began to mend so that it was presently possible to take a calmer view of the situation and to bend my thoughts upon what it were best to do next though i love the greenwood and am never so happy as when solitary yet my nature was not made alas for sylvan idleness i felt i had the greatest admiration and brotherhood with those who are recluse and shun the noisy struggles of the world yet had i always been a leader of men i now remembered as all the pages of my past history came one by one before me and i meditated upon them day and night No. I was not made to walk these woods alone, and, if another argument were wanting, it were found in the fact that I was here exposed to every weather, hungry and shelterless. I could not be for ever begging from door to door, eternally throwing my awe-inspiring shadow across the lintels of these gentle-mannered woodland folk, and my tastes, though never gluttonous, rebelled most strongly against the perpetual dietary of herbs and roots and limpid brooks. Reflecting on these things one day, as I lay friendless and ragged in the knotty elbow of a great oak's earth-bare roots, after some weeks of homeless wandering, I fell asleep and dreamed all the fair shining landscape were a tented field, 
and all the rustling rushes down by the neighbouring streamlet's banks were the serried spears of a great concourse of soldiers defiling by the sparkle of the sunlight on the ripples seeming like the play of rays upon their many warlike trappings the yellow flags and water-flowers making no poor likeness of dancing banners and bannerets it was a simple dream such as came of an empty stomach and a full head yet somehow i woke from that sleep with more of my old pulse of pleasure and life beating in my veins than had been there for a long time and with the wish for another spell of bright existence spent in the merry soldier mood that suited me so well came the means to attain it in the first stage of these wanderings while still fresh from the cloister shrine i had paid but the very smallest heed to my attire and its details i was clad in clean sufficient wraps so much was certain with a linen belt about me and sandals upon my feet yet even this was really more than i noticed with any closeness but as i ran and walked and my flesh grew hot and nervous with the fever of my sorrow a constant chafing of my feet and hands annoyed me i had stopped by a woodside river bank and there discovered with wrathful irritation that upon my bare apostolic toes and upon my sanctified thumbs those soldier thumbs still flat and strong with years of pressing sword hilts and bridle reins there were glistening in holy splendour such a set of gorgeous gems as had rarely been taken for a scramble through the woods before there were beryls and sapphires and pearls and ruddy great rubies from the kaftans of painim chiefs slain by long dead crusaders and onyx and emerald from cyprus and the remotest east set in rude red gold by the rough artificers of rearward ages and all these put upon me no doubt after the manner in which at that time credulous piety was wont to bedeck the shrine and images of saints and martyrs i was indeed at that moment the wealthiest beggar who ever sat forlorn and friendless on a grassy load but what was all this glistening store to me desolate and remorseful with but one remembrance in my heart with but one pitiful sight before my eyes i pulled the shining gems angrily from my swollen fingers and toes and hurled them one by one those princely toys into the muddy margin of the stream and there in that rude setting a blazing red and green and white and hot and cool with their wonderful scintillations they mocked me as i sat there with my chin in my palms and twinkled and shone among the sludge and scum so merrily to the flickering sunshine that presently i laughed a little at those cheerful trinkets that could shine so bravely in the contumacy of chance and after a time i picked up one and rinsed it and held it out in the sunshine and found it very fair so fair indeed that a glimmer of listless avarice was kindled within me and later on i broke a hawthorn spray and groped among the sedge and mire and hooked out thus in better mood the greater part of my strange inheritance then here i was upon this other bank waking up after my dream and turning over the better to watch the fair landscape stretching below my waistcloth came unbound and out upon the sand amid the oak roots rolled those ambient glistening rings again at first i was surprised to see such jewels in such a place staring in dull wonderment while i strove to imagine whence they came but soon i remembered piece by piece their adventure as has been told to you and now with the warm blood in my veins again i did not throw them by but lay back against the oak and chuckled to myself as my ambitious heart fluttered with pleasure under my draughty rags and crossed my legs and weighed upon my finger-tips and inventoried and valued all in the old merchant spirit those friendly treasures how unchanging are the passions of humanity i tossed those radiant playthings up in the sunlight and caught them i counted and recounted them i tore shreds from my clothing and cleaned and polished each in turn i started up angry and suspicious as a kite's wheeling shadow fell athwart my hoard forgotten was hunger and houselessness i no longer mourned so keenly the emptiness of the world or the brevity of friendships i to whom these treasures should have been so light 
overlooked nearly all my griefs in them and was as happy for the moment in this unexpected richness as a child and then after an hour or so of cheerful avarice i sat up sage and reflective and having swathed and wrapped my store safely next my heart i must needs climb the first grassy knoll showing above the woodlands and search the horizon for some place wherein a beginning might be made of spending it nothing was to be seen thence but a goodly valley spread out at a distance and there my steps were turned for men like streams ever converge upon the lowlands now that i had the heart to fall into beaten tracks coming out of the sheltering thicket byways for the first time since quitting the mounds over the ashes of Vorwood, i observed more of the new people and times among whom fate had thus thrown me and truly it was a very strange meeting with these folk who were they whom i had known when last i walked these woods and yet were not i would stare at them in perplexity marvelling at the wondrous blend of nations i saw in face and hair and eyes their very clothes were novel to me and unaccountable while their speech seemed now the oldest union of many tongues all foreign yet upon these english lips most truly native and wondrous to listen to i would pass a sturdy yokel leading out his teams to ploughing and when i spoke to him it made my ears tingle to hear how antique roman went hand in hand with ancient british and good norman was linked upon his lips with better saxon that polyglot youth knowing no tongue but one was most scholarly in his ignorance to him twas english that he spoke but to me who had lived through the making of that noble speech who knew each separate individual quantity that made that admirable whole his jargon was most wonderful nor was i yet fully reconciled to the unity of these new people and their mutual kinsmanship i could not remember all feuds were ended when down the path would come a more than usually dusky wayfarer a trooper perhaps with leather jerkin shield on back and sword by side i would note his swart complexion and dark black hair and then twas oh ho a norman villain straying from his band and back i would step among the shadows and gripping the staff that was my only weapon scowl upon him while he whistled by half mindful in my forgetfulness to help the saxon cause by wrapping the fellow over his head on the other hand if one chanced upon me who had the flaxen hair and pleasant eyes of those who once were called my comrades if he wore the rustic wasteless smock as many still did of hind or churl why then i was mighty glad to see that saxon and crossed over friendly to his pathway bespeaking him in the pure tongue of his forefathers asked him of garth and homestead and how fared his thane and heratoga all of which it grieved me afterwards to notice perplexed him greatly not only in these ways was there much for me to learn but with speech and fashions modes and means of life had changed at one time i met a strange piebald creature all tags and tassels white and red with a hundred little bells upon him a cap with peaks hanging down like asses ears and a staff with more bells tucked away under his arm he was plodding along dejected so i called to him civilly why friend who are you i am a fool sir never mind i replied cheerfully there is the less likelihood of your ever treading this earth companionless why that is true enough he said for it was too much wisdom that sent me thus solitary afield and he went on to tell me how he had been ejected that morning from a neighbouring castle i had belauded and admired my master for years therein i had many friends yet was a fool yesterday we quarrelled about some trifle i called him beast and tyrant and therein being just and truthful i lost my place and comrades over the first wise thing i said for years it is a most sorry disorderly world the phoenician must have failed to recognise in the new finery of the time the latest representative of a brotherhood that had long existed this strange individual it seemed lived by folly and though i had often noticed that wit was not a fat profession i could not help regarding him with wonder he was under his veneer of shallowness a most gentle and observant jester long study in the arts of pleasing had given him a very delicate discrimination of moods and men 
he could fit a merriment to the capacity of any man's mind with extraordinary acumen he had stores of ill-assorted learning in the empty galleries of his head and wherewithal a kindly gentle heart a whimsical companionship for sad-eyed humanity which made him haste to laugh at everything through fear of crying over it we were companions before we had gone a mile and many were the things i learnt of him when our way parted i pressed one of my rings into his hand good-bye fool i said good-bye friend he called you are the first wise man with whom i ever felt akin and indeed as his poor buffoon's coat went shining up the path i felt bereft and lonely again for a spell then i found another craftsman of this curious time a little way further on near by to a lordly house standing in wide stretches of meadow and parklands a most plaintive sound came from a thicket lying open to the sun such a dismal moaning enlisted my compassion for here i thought is some luckless wight just dying or at least in bitterest extremity of sorrow so i approached stepping lightly round the blossoming thicket peering this way and that and now down on my hands and knees to look under the bushes and now on tiptoe craning my neck that i might see over and so presently i found the source of the sighs and moans it was a young man of most dainty proportions with soft fine combed hair upon his pretty sloping shoulders his sleeves so long they trailed upon the moss his shoes laced with golden threads and towed and tasselled in monstrous fashion a most delicate perfume came from him his clothes were greener than grass in springtime turned back and puffed with damask in his hand he had a scroll whereon now and again he looked and groaned in most plaintive sort why man i asked what ails you why that dreadful moaning what are you and what is yon scroll so absorbed was he however it was only when i had walked all round him to spy the wound if it might be that he suffered from and finally stood directly in his sunshine repeating the question that he looked up interrupter of inspiration hast thou asked what i am and what this is yes and more than once fie not to see i am a minstrel a bard my lord's favourite poet up at yonder castle and this is an ode to his mistress's eyebrows i was in travail of a rhyme when thy black shadow fell upon the page give me the leaf why it is the sickliest stuff that ever did dishonour to virgin paper there take it back i said angry to find so many fools abroad and listen to me you may be a poet for i have no experience of them but as i am a man thou art not a bard you a bard you the likeness and descendant of howell ap griffith and a hundred other saxon gleemen you one of the guild of griffith ap conan you a scop or a scald why boy they could write better stuff than thou canst though they had been drunk for half a day you a stirrer of passions you a minstrel you a tightener of the strong sinews of warrior hearts fie for shame upon your silly trivial sonnets your party-coloured suits and sweet insipid vapourings out i say get home to thy lady's footstool or by thor and odin i will give thee a beating out of pure respect for noble rhyming the poets did not wait to argue i was angry and rough and the rudest clad champion that ever swung a flail in the cause of the muses so he took to his heels and as i watched that pretty butterfly aiming across the sunny meadows for his master's portals and stopping not for hedge or ditch by hoth i said laughing scornfully we might have been friends if he could but have writ as well as he can run then i went on again and had not gone far when down the road there came ambling on a mule a crafty-looking churchman with big wallets hanging at his saddle-bows a portentous rosary round his neck and bare unwashed feet hanging stirrupless by his palfrey's side now here's another tradesman i muttered to myself of this most perplexing age heaven grant his wares are superior to the last ones good morning father good morning son art going into the town to take up arms for christ and his servant edward yes i answered i'm bound to the town but i've not yet chosen a master 
then you are all the more sure to go to the fighting for every one just now who has no other calling is apprenticed to arms it will not be the first time i have taken that honourable indenture no i guess not said the shrewd friar eyeing me under his penthouse eyebrows thou art a stout and wiry-looking fellow and may i never read anything better than my breviary again if i cannot construe in your face a good and varied knowledge of camps and cities but there was something else i had to say to you here comes the point of the narrative i thought to myself now so trim a soldier as you and one wherewithal so reflective would surely not willingly go where hostile swords are waving and cruel french spears are thicker than yonder tall bladed grass unshriven with all thy sins upon thy back why then monk i must stay at home is that what you would say nay not at all there is a middle way but soft hast any money with thee enough to get a loaf of bread and a cup of ale oh said the secret partner for his calling was then under ban and fine a little disappointedly that is something small but yet nevertheless he muttered partly to himself these are poor times and when all plump partridges are abroad mother church's falcons must necessarily fly at smaller game look here good youth forgo thy mortal appetites defer thy bread and ale and for that money saved thereby i will sell thee one of these priceless parchments here in my wallet scrolls young man hot from the holy footstool of our blessed father in rome and carrying complete unction and absolution to the soul of their possessor think youth is not eternal redemption worth a cup of muddy ale fie to hesitate line thy bosom with this blessed scroll and go to war cleaner hearted than a new-born babe there i will not be exacting for one of those silver groats i fancy i see tied in thy girdle i will give thee absolute admittance into the blessed company of saints and martyrs i tell thee man for half a zecchin i will make thee comrade of christ and endow thee with eternity is it a bargain silent and disdainful i who had seen a dozen hierarchies rise and set in the various peopled skies of the world took the parchment from him and turned away and read it it was as he said more shame on human intellect a full pardon of the possessor's sins wrote out in bad norman latin and bearing the sign and benediction of st peter's chair i read it from top to bottom then twisted its red tapes around it again and threw it back to that purveyor of absolutions yes and i turned upon that reverend traveller and scorned and scouted him and his contemptible baggage i told him i had met two sad fools since noon but he was worse than either i scoffed him just as my bitter mood suggested until i had spent both breath and invention then turned contemptuous and left him at bay mumbling inarticulate maledictions upon my biting tongue no more of these shallow panderers fell into my path to vex and irritate me and before the white evening star was shining through the brilliant tapestry of the sunset over the meadowlands in the west i had drawn near to and entered the strong shadowy moated walls of my first english city End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I took lodgings that evening with some rough soldiers who kept guard over the town gate and slept as soundly by their watch fire as though my country clothes were purple and a stony bench in an angle of the walls were a princely couch. But when the morning came, I determined to better my condition with this object in view one of the smallest of my rings was selected and with this conveniently hidden i went down into the town to search for a jeweller's a strange town indeed it struck me as being narrow and many were the streets and paved with stones timber and plaster jutting out overhead so as to lessen the fair free sky to a narrow strip and greatly to compress my country spirit at every lattice window so amply provided with glass as i had never known before they were hanging out linen at that early hour to air 
and the prentice lads came yawning and stretching to their master's shutter booths and every now and then down the quaint streets of that curious city which had sprung peopled with a new race from the earth during the long night of my sleep there rumbled a country tumbril loaded with rustic things whereat the women came out to chaffer and buy of the smocked cartsmen who spoke the glib english so novel to my ear and laughed and gossiped with them the early wear i noticed in his cart was still damp and sparkling with the morning dew so close upon the dawn had he come in and there in the town where the deep street shadows still lay undisturbed now and then a jew still ashamed it seemed to meet any of those sleepy christian eyes would steal by to an early bargain wrapped to his chin in his gabardine i knew that garment a thousand years ago and fearfully slinking in that intolerant time from house to house and shadow to shadow now and then as i sauntered along in a city of novelties a couple of revellers in extraordinary various clothes their toes longer than their sleeves their velvet caps quaintly peaked and slashed doublets showing gay vests below came reeling and singing up the back ways making the half-wake dogs dozing in the gutters snarl and snap at them and disturbing the morning meal of the crows rooting in the litter heaps as the sun came up and the fresh white light of that fair plantagenet morning crept down the faces of the eastward walls the city woke to its daily business a page came tripping over the cobbles with a message in his belt the good wives were astir in all the houses and the prentices fell to work manfully on booth and bars as merchant and mendicant early gallant and basketed maid began the day in earnest all these things i saw from under the broad rim of my rustic hat my ragged sorrel green cloak thrown over my shoulder and across my face and so disguised silent observant now recognising something of that yesterday that was so long ago and anon sad and dubious i went on until i found what i sought for and came into a smooth broad street where the jewellers had their stalls i chose one of those who seemed in a fair way of business and entered are you the master here i asked of a grey-bearded merchant who was searching for the spectacles he had put away overnight my neighbours say so he answered gruffly then i would trade with you whereon having found and adjusted his great horn-glasses he eyed me superciliously from head to foot then said in a tone of derision as you wish friend countryman but will you trade in pearl and sapphire or diamond pins and brooches perhaps or is it only for broken victuals of my last night's supper keep thy victuals for thy lean and hungry lads i will trade with you in pearl and sapphire and thereon from under my mouldy rags i brought a lordly ring that danced and sparkled in the clear sunlight stealing through the mullioned windows of his booth and threw quivering rainbow hues upon the white walls of the little den dazzling the blinking delighted old man in front of me how much for that i asked throwing it down in front of him it was a better gem than he had seen for many a day and having turned it over loving and wistful he whispered to me for he thought i had surely stolen it one sixteenth of its value thereon i laughed at him and threw down my cap and took the ring and gave him such a lecture on gems and jewels all out of my old phrygian merchant knowledge so praised and belauded the shine and water of each single shining point in that golden circlet that presently i had sold it to him for near its value then i bought a leather wallet and put the money in and traded again lower down the street with another ring and then again at good prices for competition was close among these goldsmiths and none liked me to sell the beautiful things i showed them one by one to their rivals i sold two more surely surely good youth questioned one merchant to me these trinkets were made for some master abbot's thumb or some blessed saint and surely again my friend i answered you have just seen them drawn from a layman's finger well well he said i will give you your price and then as he turned away to pack them he muttered to himself a stout cudgel seems a good profession nowadays if it were not through fear yon flemish rascal over the road might take the gem i at least would never deal with such an obvious footpad 
By this time I was rich, and my wallet-purse hung low and heavy at my girdle. So away I went to where some tailors lived, and accosted the best of them. Here the cross-legged sewers, who sat on the sill among shreds of hundred-coloured stuffs, and the bent white-fingered embroiderers, stopped their work, and gaped to hear the ragged way-worn loafer, whose broad shadow darkened their doorway, ask for silks and satins, ypres and velvet. One youthful churl, under the master's eyes, unbonneted, and in mock civility asked me whether I would have my sortout of crimson or silver, whether my jupons should be strung with seedling pearls, or just plain sewn with golden thread and lace. He said, that harmless scoffer, he knew a fine pattern a noble lord had lately worn, of miniver and silver, which would very neatly suit me. But I, disdainful, not putting my hand to my loaded pouch as another might have done, only let the ragged homespun fall from across my face, and taking the cap from my raven hair and grim weather-beaten face, turned upon them. The laughter died away in that little den as I did so, the embroiderer's needle stuck half-way through its golden fabric. The workers stared upon me open-mouthed. The cutter's shears shut with a snap upon the rustling webs, and then forgot to open, while prentice lads stood, all with yard wands in their hand, most strangely spellbound by my presence. The conquest was complete without a word, and no one moved, until presently down shuffled the master tailor from his dusky corner, and, waving back his foolish boys bowed low with sudden reverence as he asked with many epithets of respect in how he might serve me thanks i said my friend what i need is only this that you should express upon me some of these tardy but courteous commendations translate me from these rags to the livery of gentility express in good stuffs upon me some of that nobility your quick perception has now discovered in brief suit me at once as a not too fantastic knight of your time is clad and have no doubt about my paying whereupon i quickened his willingness by a sight of my broad pieces well they had just such vests and tunics and hose as i needed and these according to the fashion being laced behind and drawn in at the middle by a loose sword-belt fitted me without special making my vest was of the finest doe-skin scalloped round the edge bound with golden tissue and worked all up the front with the same in leaves and flowers my hose were as green as rushes and my shoes pointed and upturned half way to my knees on my shoulders hung a loose cloak of green velvet of the same hue as my hose lined and puffed with the finest grass green satin that ever came in merchant bales from overseas over my right arm it was held by a golden emerald brooch, a morse, that worthy clothier termed it, bigger than my palm, and this tunic hung to my small laced middle. My maunch sleeves were lined by ermine, and hung to my ankles a yard and more in length. On my head my cap again was all of ermine and velvet, bound with strings of seed-pearls. That same kindly hosier, got me a pretty playtime dagger of gold and sapphire for my hip and green satin gloves sewn thick upon the back with golden threads this he said was a fair and knightly vestment such as became a goodly soldier when he did not wear his harness but with naught about it of the courtly sumptuousness which so hard and warlike seeming a lord as i no doubt despised from hence i went by many a cobble pavement to where the noisy sound of hammers and anvils filled the narrow streets, and mighty busy I discovered the armor-smiths. There was such a riveting and hammering, such a fitting and filing and brazing going on, that it seemed as though every man in the town were about to don steel and leather. There were long-legged pages in garb of rainbow hue, hurrying about with orders to the armourers, or carrying home their master's finished helms or warlike gear. There were squires and men-at-arms, idly watching at the forge doors, the pulsing hammers, weld rivets and chains. And ever and anon a man-at-arms would come pushing through these groups with sheaves of broken arrows to be ground, or an armful of pikes to be rehandled, casting them down upon the cumbered floor. 
or perhaps it was a squire come along the way leading over the cobbles a stately war-horse to the shoeing in truth it was a sight to please a soldier's eyes and right pleasant was it to me to hear the proud neighing of the chargers the laughing and the talk the busy whir of grindstone on sword and axes the clangour of the hammers as hot white spearheads went to the noisy anvil while forges beat in unison to the singing of the smiths ah and i walked slowly down those streets wondering and watching with vast pleasure in the busy scene though every now and then it came over me how solitary i was i the one impassive in this turmoil to whom the very stake they prepared to fight for was unknown a little way off were the booths where stores of milan armour was for sale to them i went and was shown piles and stacks of harness such as never man saw before all of steel and golden inlay covering every point of a warrior and so rich and cumbersome that it was only with great hesitation i submitted my free phrygian limbs to a steel casementing but i was a gentleman now whereof to witness came my gorgeous apparel backing the grim authority of my face and the bargaining was easy enough scogula and mister but those swart olive-skinned hook-nosed jewish apprentices screwed me up and braced me down into that suit of milan steel until i could scarcely breathe their black-eyed master all the time belauding the sit and comfort of it god sir quoth he men is the hauberk i've seen laced on knightly shoulders but by the mail from the back of the gittite who fell in shocko i never saw a coat of lynx sit closer or truer than that and then again there's a gorget for you sir why if ahab had but possessed such a one as i am a miserable poor merchant and your valour's very humble servant even the blessed arrows of israel would have glanced off harmlessly from his ungodly body and the cunning sanctimonious old jew went fawning and smiling round while his helpers pent me up in my glittering hide until i was steel and gold inlay from heel to heel by abraham noble sir those greaves become your legs pull them in a little more at the ankles isaac and here's a tabard sir of crimson velvet and emblazoned borderings a prince might gladly wear then they put a helm upon me with a visor and beaver through which i frowned as ill at ease as a young goshawk with his first hood and girded me with a broad belt chosen from many and a good english broadsword the dagger misericordia at my hip and knightly spurs they gave me that rank without question upon my heels so that i was completely armed at last after the fantastic style of the time and fit to take my place again in the red ranks of my old profession i will not weary you with many details of the process whereby i adapted myself to the times from that armourer's shop i went leaving my mail to be a little altered to a hostelry in the centre square of the town and there i fed and rested there too i chose a long-legged squire from among those who hung about every street corner and he turned out a most accomplished knave i never knew a villain who could lie so sweetly in his master's service as that party-coloured curly-headed henchman he fetched my armour back the next day cheating the armourer at one end of the errand and me at the other he got me a charger filling the grey-stoned yard with capering palfreys that i might make my choice and over the price of my selection he cozened the dealers and hoodwinked me he was the most accomplished youth in his station that ever thrust a vagrom leg into green and canary tights or put a cock's feather into a borrowed cap he would sit among the wallflowers on the inn-yard wall and pipe french ditties till every lattice window round had its idle sewing maid he would swear out in the market-place when he lost at dice or skittles until the bronze troopers looking on blushed under their tawny hides at his supreme expurlatives there was not such a lad within the town walls for strut for brag or bully yet when he came in to render the service due to me he ministered like a soft white-fingered damsel he combed my long black hair anointing it and washing it with wondrous scents 
whereof he sold me files at usurious interest he whispered into my sullen unnoticing ear a constant stream of limpid sparkling scandal he cleaned my armour till it shone like a brook in maytime and stole my golden lace and a dozen of the sterling links from my dagger chain he knew the wittiest most delicately licentious songs that ever were writ by a minstrel and he could cook such dishes as might have made a dying anchorite sit up and feast strange incomprehensible that wayward youth went forth one day on his own affairs and met in the yard two sturdy loafers who spoke of me and calling me penniless unknown infamous and french perhaps for they doubted i was good english whereon that gallant youth of mine fell on them and fought them there right under my window and beat them both and flogged their dusty jackets all across the market-place to the tune of their bellowings and all this for his master's honour then having done so much he proceeded with his private errand which was to change for his own advantage at a mean fleming shop those pure golden spurs of mine secreted in his bosom into a pair of common brass ones for five days i had lain in that town in magnificent idleness and had spent nearly all my rings and money when one day as i sat moody and alone by the porch of the inn drinking in the sun my idle valour rusting for service and looking over the market square with its weather-worn central fountain its cobblestones mortared together with green moss and quaint surroundings there came cantering in and over to my rest-house three goodly knights in complete armour with squires behind them their pennons fluttering in the wind tall white feathers streaming from their helms and their swords and maces rattling at the saddle-bows to the merriest of tunes they pulled up by the open lattice and throwing their broad bridles to the ready squires came clattering up dusty and thirsty past where i lay my inglorious silken legs outstretched upon the window bench and the sunlight all ashine upon the gorgeous raiment that irked me so they were as jolly fellows as one could wish to see and they tossed up their beavers and called for wine and poured it down their throats with a pleasure pleasant enough to watch then for they could not unlace themselves in came their lads and fell to upon them and unscrewed and lifted off the great helms and piece by piece all the glittering armour and piling it on the benches the knights the while sighing with relief as each plate and buckle was relaxed and so they got them at last down to their quilted vests and then the gallants sat to table and fell to laughing and talking until their dinner came from what i gathered they were on their way to war and war upon that fair fertile country yonder over the narrow seas jove how they did revile the frenchman and drain their beakers to a merry meeting with him until ever as they chattered the feeling grew within me that here was the chance i was waiting for i would join them and since it was the will of the incomprehensible draw my sword once more in the cause of this fair many-mastered island nor was there long to wait for an excuse they began talking of king edward's forces presently and how that every man who could spin a sword or sit a war-horse was needed for the coming onset and how more especially leaders were wanting for the host gathering so they said away by the coast whereon at once i arose and went over sitting down at their table and told them that i had some knowledge of war and though just then i lacked a quarrel i would willingly espouse their cause if they would put me in the way of it in my interest and sympathy i had forgot they had not known i was so close and now the effect which my sudden appearance always had on strangers made them all stare at me as though i were a being of another world as indeed i was of many other worlds and yet the comely stalwart raven-tressed silk-swathed fellow who sat there before them at the white scrubbed board marking their fearful wonder with regretful indifference was solid and real and presently the eldest of them swallowed his surprise and spoke out courteously for all saying they would be glad enough to help my wishes and then warming with good fellowship as the first effect of my entry wore off he added they were that afternoon bound for the rendezvous as he termed it at a near castle and if i could wear harness as fitly as i could wear silk and had a squire and a horse 
they would willingly take me along with them. So it was settled, and in a great bumper they drank to me, and I to them, and thus informally was I admitted to the ranks of English chivalry. We ate and drank and laughed for an hour or two, and then sat with our host and got into our armour. This to them was customary enough, nor was it now so difficult a thing to me, for I had donned and doffed my gorgeous steel casings by way of practice so often in seclusion that, when it came to the actual test, assisted with the nimble fingers of that varlet of mine, I was in panoply from head to heel, helmeted and spurred before the best of them. Ah, and I was not so old yet but that I could delight in what, after all, was a noble vestment, and as I looked round upon my knightly comrades, draining the last drops of their flagons while their squires braced down their shining plates, and girt their steel hips with noble brands, the while I knew in my heart that if they were strong and stalwart, I was stronger and more stalwart, and if they carried proud hearts and faces shining there under their nodding plumes of gentle birth and handsome soldierliness, no less did I. Knowing all this, I say, and feeling peer to those comely peers, I had a flush of pride and contentment again in my strangely varied lot. Then the grooms brought round our gay ribboned horses to the cobbles in front, where, mounting, we presently set out, as goodly a four as ever went clanking down a sunny market-place, while the maids waved white handkerchiefs from the overhanging lattices, and townsmen and prentices uncapped them to our dancing pennons. We rode some half-score miles through a fertile country towards the west, now cantering over green undulations, and anon picking a way through woodland coppices, where the chequered light played daintily upon our polished furniture, and the spear-points rustling ever and anon against the green boughs overhead. "'What of this good knight to whose keep we are going?' asked one of my companions presently. "'He is reputed rich, and what is convenient in these penurious times, blessed only with daughters.' "'Why,' responded the fellow at his elbow, who set no small store by a head of curly chestnut hair and a handsome face below it, "'if that is so, in truth, I am not at all sure but that I will respectfully bespeak one of those fair maids. I am half convinced I was not born to die on some scoundrel Frenchman's rusty toasting iron. Tis a cursed, perilous expedition, this of ours, and I never thought so highly of the advantages of a peaceful and Christian life as I have this last day or two. Now, which of these admirable maids dost thou think most accessible, good Delafosse? he asked, turning to the horseman, who acted as our guide, by right of previous knowledge here. Well, quoth that youth, after a moment's hesitation, I must frankly tell you, Ralph, that I doubt if there are any two maids within a score of miles of us who have been tried so often by such as you, and proved more intractable. The knight, their father, is a rough old fellow, as rich as though he were an abbot, hale and frank with every one. You may come or go about his halls, for they have no mother, lay what seed you like to his girls, nor will he say a word. So far so well, and many a pretty gallant asks no better opportunity. But because you begin thus propitious, it does not follow either fair citadel is yours. No, these virgin walls have stood unmoved a hundred assaults, and as much escalading as only a country swarming with poor desperate youths can in any way explain. Saint Denis, exclaimed the other, all this but fans the spark of my desire. Oh, desire by all means, if wishes could bring down well-lined maidenhoods, those were a mighty scarce commodity. But soberly, does thy comprehensive valour intend to siege both these heiresses at once, or will one of them suffice? One gentle Delafosse, and when my exulting pennon flutters triumphant from that captured turret, I will in gratitude help thee to mount the other. Difference, then, beguile this all too tedious way with an account of their peculiar graces which maid dost thou think i might the most aptly sue well you may try of course but remember i hold out no hope neither of the elder nor of the younger that one the first is as magnificent a shrew as ever laughed an honest lover to scorn she is as black and comely as any daughter of zion tis to her near every night yields at first glance but gads it does them little good 
she has a heart like the nether millstone and as for pride she is prouder than lucifer i know not what game it may be this swart circe sees upon the skyline some say it is even for that bold boy the young prince himself now gone with his father to france she waits and some others say she will look no lower than a duke backed by the wealth of the grand soldan himself but whoever it may be he has not yet come by the bones of st thomas a becket the young knight laughed i have a mind that knight and i may cross the drawbridge together canst tell me out of good comradeship any weak place in this damsel's harness there is none i know of she is proof at every point indeed i am nigh reluctant to let one like you whose heart has ripened in the sun of experience so much faster than his head engage upon such a dangerous venture they say one gallant was so stung by the calm scorn with which he mocked his offer that he went home and hung himself to a cellar beam and another blind in desperate love leapt from her father's walls and fell in the courtyard a horrid shapeless mass young de vipon as you know stabbed himself at her feet and tis told the maid's wrath was all because his spurting heart's blood soiled her wimple a day before it was due to go to wash how thrives thy inclination oh well enough twould take more than this to spoil my appetite but nevertheless let us hear something of the other sister this elder is obviously a proud minx who has set her heart on lordly game and will not marry because her suitors seem too mean how is it with the other girl why said delafosse it is even more hopeless with her she will not marry for the cold sufficient reason that her suitors be all men a most abominable offence ah so she thinks it but such a tender shy and modest maid there is not in the boast of the county while the elder will hear you out arms crossed on pulseless bosom cold disdainful eyes fixed with haughty stare to yours the other will not stop to listen no not so much as to the first inkling of your passion breathe so little as half a sigh or tint your speech with a rosy glint of dawning love and she is away lighter than thistle-down on the upland breeze i know of but two men loose worldly fellows both of them who cornered her and they came from her presence looking so crestfallen so abashed at their hopes so melancholy to think on their gross manliness as it had appeared against the white celibacy of that maid that even some previous suitors sorrowed for them this is i think the safer venture but even the least hopeful is the maid all fallow like that has she no human faults to set against so much sterile virtue of her faults i cannot speak but you must not hold her altogether insipid and shallow she is less approachable than her sister and contemns and fears our kind yet she is straight and tall in person and i have heard from a foster-brother of hers can sit a fiery charger new from stall like a groom or horse-boy she is the best shot with a crossbow of any on the castle green and in the women's hall as merry a romp as ready for fun or mischief as any village girl that ever kept a twilight tryst on a saturday evening gads a most pleasant description i will keep tryst with this one for a certainty not only saturdays but six other days out of the week the black jade may wait for her princeling for a hundred years as far as i'm concerned how far is it to the castle i am hot in patience itself nor need your patience cool look said delafosse and as he spoke we turned a bend in the woodland road and there a mile before us flashing back the level sun from towers and walls that seemed of burnished copper was the noble pile we sought Sets, when we came up to it it was a fine place indeed cunningly built with fosses round about long barbican walls within them turreted and towered and below these again were other walls so shrewdly designed for defence as to move any soldier heart with wonder and delight but if the walls did pleasure me the great keep within towering high into the sky with endless buttresses and towers and casements grim massive and stately rearing its proud circumference embattled and serrated far beyond the reach of rude assault or desperate onset filled me with pride and awe i scarce could take my eyes from those red walls shining so molten in the setting sun 
yet round about the country lay very fair to look at all beyond that noble pile the land dropped away on two sides by sheer cliffs to the shining river underneath and on the others in gentle grassy undulations dotted with great trees whereunder lay encamped by tent and watchfire the rear of king edward's army and then on again into the pleasant distance that lay stretched away in hill and valley towards the yellow west all over that wide campaign were scattered the villages of serfs and vassals who grew corn for the lordly owner in peacetime and followed his banner in battle and in that knightly stronghold up above there were i found when i came to know it better many kinsmen and women who sheltered under my lord's liberality dowagers dwelt in the wings and young squires of good name a jolly noisy unruly crew harboured down in the great vaulted chambers by the sally-port there were kinsmen of the left-hand degree in the warder's lodge by the gates and poor wearers of the same noble escutcheon up among the jackdaws and breezes of the highest battlements and so generous was the king's bounty so ample the sweep of his castellated walls and labyrinthine the mazes of the palace keep they encircled so abundant the income of his tithes and tenure dues and fees that all these folk found living and harbourage with him and not only did it not irk that lord but only to his steward and hall porter was it known how many guests there were or when a man came or went or how many hundred horses stood in the stalls or how many score of vassals fed in the great kitchen on sundays after mass the smooth green in the centre of the castle would be thronged with men and maids in all their finery while the quintains spun merrily under the mock onsets of the young knights and dame and gallant trod the stony battlements and down among the wide shadow of the cedar trees on the slope twas a crusader who brought the saplings from palestine vassal and yeoman idled and made love or frolicked with their merry little ones over all that gallant show my lord's great blazon snaps and flaunted in the wind upon the highest dungeon and in the halls beneath the lords and ladies sat in the deep-seated windows and laughed and sang and jested in the mullion tinted sunshine with all the courtly extravagance of their brilliant day ah by old isis at that time the world it seemed to me was less complex and the rules of life were simpler kingcraft had found its mould and fashion in the courageous edward and the first duty of a noble was then nobility the knights swore by their untarnished chivalry and the vassals by their loyalty yes and it was priestly then to fear god and hell and every woman was or would be lovely so ran the simple creed of those who sang or taught while near every one believed them but you who live in a time when there is no belief but that of incredulence when the creative skill and forethought of the great primeval cause is open to the criticism and cavil of every base human atom it has brought about you know better you know how vain their dream was how foolish their fidelity how simple their simplicity how contemptible their courage and how mean by the side of your love of mediocrity their worship of ideals and heroes by the bright theban flames to which my fathers swore by the grim shadow of osiris which dogged the track of my old phoenician bark i was soon more english than any of them but while i thus tell you the thoughts that came of experience i keep you waiting at the castle gate they admitted us by drawbridged and portcullised arch into the centre space and there we dismounted then down the steps to greet guests of such good degree came the gallant grizzled old lord himself in his quilted under-armour vest we made obeisance and in a few words the host very courteously welcomed his guests leading us in state after we had given our helmets to the pages at the door into the great hall of his castle where we found a throng of ladies and gallants in every variety of dress filling those lofty walls with life and colour in truth it was a noble hall the walls bedecked with antlers or spoils of woodcraft with heads and horns and bows and bills and tapestry and the ceiling wonderfully wrought with carved beams as far down that ample corridor 
as one could see. The floor of oak was dark with wear, yet as smooth and reflective to many-coloured petticoats and rainbow-tinted shoes as the Parian marble of some fair Roman villa. And on the other side there were fifty windows deep set in the wall, with gay stainings on them of parable and escutcheon, while on the benches, fingering ribboned mandolins, whispering gentle murmurs under the tinselled lawn of fair ladies' kerchiefs, or sauntering to and fro across the great chamber's ample length, were all these good and gentle folk, bedecked and tasselled and ribboned in a way that made that changing scene a fairy show of colour. Strange indeed was it for me to walk among the glittering throng, all prattling that merry medley they called their native English, and to remember all I could remember, to recall Briton, Roman, Norseman, Norman, Saxon, and to know each and all of those varied peoples were gone, gone for ever, gone beyond a hope or chance of finding. And yet, again, to know that each and every one of these nations, whose strong life in turn had given colour to my life, was here, here before me, consummated in this people. Oh, it was strange and almost past belief, and ever as I went among them in fairer silks and ermines than any, yet underneath that rustling show I laughed to know that I was nothing but the old Phoenician merchant, nothing but Electra's petted paramour, the strong unruly Saxon thane. And if I thought thus of them, in sooth, they thought no less strangely of me. Ever as my good host led me here and there from group to group, the laughter died away on cherry lips, and minstrel fingers went all a-wandering down their music-strings, as one and all broke off in mid-pleasure, to stare in mute perplexity and wonder at me. From group to group we went, my host at each, making me known to many a glittering lord and lady, and to each of those courtly presences I made in return that good Saxon bow, which subsequently I found in stable fashion had made exceeding rustic. Presently, in this way, we came to a gay knot of men, collected round two fair women, the one of them seated in a great velvet chair, holding court, as I could guess, by word and action, over the bright constellations that played about her, the other within the circle, yet not of it, standing a little apart and turned from us as we approached. Alianora, the first of these noble damsels, was the elder daughter of the master of the house, and the second, Isabel, was his younger child. The first of these was a queen of beauty, and from that first moment when I stood in front of her, and came under the cold, proud shine of those black eyes, I loved her. Jove! I felt the hot fire of love leap through my veins on the instant as I bowed me there at her footstool, and forgot everything else from the moment, merging all the world against the inaccessible heart of that beautiful girl. Indeed, she was one who well might play the queen among men. Her hair was black as night, and, after the fashion of the time, worked up to either side of her head into a golden filigree crown, beaded with shining pearls, extraordinary regal. Black were her eyes as any slow, and her smooth, calm face was wonderful and goddess-like in the perfect outline and colour. Never a blush of shame or fear, never a sign of inward feeling, stirred that haughty damsel's mood. By Venus, I wonder why we loved her so. To whisper gentle things into her ear was but like dropping a stone into some deep well. The ripples on the dark, sullen water were not more cold, silent, intangible than her responsive smile. She was too proud even to frown, that disdainful English peeress. But instead, at slight or negligence, she would turn those unwavering eyes of hers upon the luckless white, and look upon him, so that there was not a knight, though of twenty fights, there was not a gallant, though never so experienced in gentle tawny with ladies' eyes, who durst meet them. To this maid I knelt, and rose in love against all my better instinct, wildly, recklessly enamoured of her shining, Circean queenliness. Ah! So enthralled was I by the black Alianora that my host had to pluck me by the sleeve ere he whispered to me, 
another daughter sir stranger divide your homage and he led me to the younger girl now if the elder sister had won me at first sight my feelings were still more wonderful to the other if the elder had the placid sovereignty of the evening sky isabel was like the planet of the morning from head to heel she was in white upon her forehead her fair brown hair was strained back under a coverchief and wimple as colourless as the hawthorn flowers this same fair linen in the newest fashion of demurity came down her cheeks and under her chin framing her face in oval in pretty mockery of the steel coif of an armed knight her dress below was of the whitest softest stuff with long hanging sleeves a wondrous slender middle drawn in by a silk and silver cestus belt made like a warrior's sword-wear and a skirt that descended in pretty folds to her feet and lay a-twining about them in comely ampleness she was as supple as a willow wand and tall and straight and her face when in a moment she turned it on me was wondrous pleasant to look at the very opposite of her sister's all pink and white and honestly ashine with demure fun and merriment the which constantly twinkled in her downcast eyes and kept the pretty corners of her mouth a-twitching with covert ill-suppressed unruly smiles a fair and tender young girl indeed made for love and gentleness unhappy isabel luckless victim of an accursed fate wretched perverse phoenician ill-omened alianora between us three sprang up two fatal passions read on and you shall see end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the wonderful adventures of fra the phoenician by edwin lester arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain now when that fair young english girl at her father's voice turned to acknowledge my presence thinking it was some other new knight of the many who came there every hour she lifted her eyes to mine and then all on a sudden without rhyme or reason she started back and blanched whiter than her own wimple and then flushed again equally unaccountably and fell a-trembling and staring at me in a wondrous fashion she came a step forward as though she would greet some long-looked-for friend and then withdrew and half held out her hand and took it back the while the colour came and went upon her cheeks in quick flushes and stirred by some strange emotion her bosom rose and fell under the golden cestus and the lawn with the stress of her feelings the sudden storm however invoked shook that sweet fabric most mightily there in that very minute it seemed there in that merry careless place in sight of me but a gaudy gallant a little more thoughtful looking perhaps than those she often saw yet all the same naught but a stranger gallant unknown and nameless to her moved by some affinity within us just as the alchemist's magic touch converts between two breaths one elixir in his crucibles to another so before my eyes i saw in that fair girl's pallid face love flush through her veins and light her heart and eyes with a responding blush and i i the unhappy i the sorrow bestower as i saw her first what of all things in this wide world should i think of what should leap up in my mind as i perked my gilded scabbard and bowed low to the polished oaken floor in my glittering plantagenet finery what vision should come to me in that latter-day hall among those mandolin fingering courtiers before that costly raimented maiden the fair heiress of a thousand years of care and gentle living that girl leaning frightened and shy upon the arm of her strong father like a soft white mist-cloud in the shadow of a mountain what thought what idea but a swift revision of blodwyn my wild ruddy untutored british wife all those gaudy butterflies of the new day that stately home and that fair flower herself shrank into nothing and as the white lightning leaps through the dull void of midnight and shows for one dazzling second some long-remembered country 
a shine in every leaf and detail to the startled pilgrim and then is gone with all the ghostly mirage of its passage so in that surprising moment so full of import blodwyn rose to my mind against all reason and likelihood blodwyn the briton the ruddy-haired blodwyn radiant with her gentle motherhood blodwyn who could scream so fiercely to her clansmen in the forefront of conflict and drive her bloody chariot through the red mud of battle with wounded foemen writhing under her remorseless wheels more blithely than a latter-day maid would trip through the spangled meadow-grass of springtime blodwyn rose before me oh twas wild twas foolish past explaining nonsense and angry with myself and that white maid who stood and hung her head before me i stroked my hand across my face to rid me of the fancy and gathering myself together made my bow murmuring something fiercely civil and turned my back upon her to seek another group yes but if you think i conquered that fancy you are wrong for days and days it haunted me even though i laughed it to scorn and what made the matter more difficult more perplexing was that i had not guessed in error the unhappy isabel had loved me from first sight and against every precedent her nature would have warranted grew daily deeper in the toils and i who never yet had turned from the eyes of suppliant maid watched her colour shift and fly as i came or went and strode gloomy unmindful through all her pretty artifices of maiden tenderness burning the meanwhile with love for her disdainful sister it was a strange medley and in one phase or another pursued me all the time i was in that noble keep when i was not wooing i was being wooed alas and all the coldness i got from that black-browed lady with the goddess carriage and the faultless skin i passed on to the poor enamoured girl who dogged my idle footsteps for a word thus on one day we had a tournament all round the great castle under the oaks were pitched the tents of the troopers while the pennons and bannerets of knights and barons as we saw them from the turret top shone in the sunlight like a field of flowers the soldier yeomen had their sports and contests on the greensward and we went down to watch them thor but i never saw such bronzed and stalwart fellows or witnessed anything like the truth and straightness of those stinging flights of shafts the archers sent against their butts then the next day following the sports of the common people in the tilt-yard inside the barbican we held a tourney a mock battle and a breaking of spears a very gorgeous show indeed and near as exciting as an honest melee itself so tuneful in my ears proved the shivering of lances and the clatter of swords on the steel panoply of the knights that though at first i held aloof stern and gloomy with my futile passion yet presently i itched to take a spear and since those sparkling riders liked the fun so much to let them try whether my right hand had lost the cunning it learnt before their fathers were conceived and as i thought so standing among the chief ones in that brilliant tawny ring up came the white rose and tempted me to break a lance and sighed so softly and brushed against me with her scented draperies and tried with feeble self-command to meet my eyes and could not and was so obviously wishful that i should ride a course or two and so prettily in love that i was near relenting of any coldness i did unbend so much as to consent to mount a page fetched my armour and my mighty black charger draped in crimson blazoned velvet and ribboned from head to tail and then i went to the rear of the lists and put on the steel thanks good squire i said to the youth who thrust my pointed toes into the stirrups when i was on my horse now give me up my gauntlets and post me in my principles fie sir not to know quoth he the worship of weapons and the honour of fair ladies thanks that is not difficult to remember and as to my practice ah there you confuse him put in a jester standing by no good knight likes to be bound too closely as to that as i rode round the lists a white hand from under the sister's dais to whom belonging i well could guess threw me a flower the which fell under my sleek charger's hoofs and was stamped into the trodden mould and then the trumpet sounded 
avant called the glittering marshal and we met in mid career seven strong knights did i jerk from their high-peaked saddles that morning and won a lady's golden head-ring and rode round about the circus with it on my lance point when i came under where isabel sat i saw her fair cheeks redder than my ribbons with maiden expectation but as i passed without a sign they grew whiter than her lawn and then i reined up and deposited that circlet at the footstool of her sister the proud cold maid accepted the homage as was her duty but scarcely deigned to lower her eyes to the level of my helmet plumes while her father put it on her forehead a merry time we had in that courtly place waiting for the signal to start and much did i learn and note soon the favourite gallant in that goodly company the acknowledged strongest spearman in the lists the best teller of strange stories by an evening fire but never an inch of way could i make with the impenetrable girl on whom my wayward heart was set while the other the younger made her sweet self the pointing stock of high and low she was so blindly so obviously in love one day it came to a climax we met by chance in a glade of black shadows among the cedar branches i and that damsel in white and finding i would not woo her she set to work and wooed me so sweet so strong so passionate that to this day i cannot think how i withstood it yes and that fair slim maid renowned through all the districts for her gentle reticence when i would not answer love with love and glance for glance fired up with white hot passion threw hesitance to the wind and besought and knelt to me and asked no more than to be my slave so sweet so reckless in her passion that it was not the high-born english lady who knelt there but rather it seemed to me my dear fiery untutored british princess fool i was not to see it then witless after so much not to guess the tameless spirit the intruder soul that poor girl at my feet held unwitting in her bosom she came to me as i have said all in a gust of feeling unlike herself and when i would not say that which she longed to hear she wrung her hands and then down she came upon her knees and clipped me round my jewelled belt and confessed her love for me in such a headlong rush of tearful eloquence i durst not write it lady i said lifting the supple girl to her feet i grieve but it is useless forget forgive i cannot answer as you would ah but she answered rushing again to the onset sighing as now the hot strange love that burnt within her and now her sweet native spirit strove for mastery surely i think i am possessed i will not take no for an answer i am consumed oh fie to say it for thee i am not first in thy dear affection why then i will be second not second then i will be the hundredth from thy heart my light my life and fate i cannot live without thee oh as you were born by your mother's consummated love as thou hast ever felt compunction for a white-cheeked maid have pity on me i tell thee i will follow thee to the ends of the earth lord how my tongue runs on for one moiety of that affection perhaps a happier woman has i will serve thee through life thou hast no wife tis said to hinder thou art a soldier and a score of them ere i was touched with this strange infection have sued hopeless for but a chance of that which is proffered thee so freely truth they have told me i was fair and tall with a complexion that ridiculed the water-lilies on the moat and hair one said was like ripe corn with a harvest sun upon it it makes me blush i heard her whisper to herself to apprise myself like this and yet you stand averse and sullen with eyes turned from me and deaf ears am i a sight so dreadful to you maid i cried shutting out her suppliant beauty from my heart over full as i thought it of that other one her sister no man could look at you and not be moved the wayward immortals have given you more sweetness than near any other woman i ever saw a sight so dreadful to me why you are fairer than an early morning in may when the new sun gets up over the wet flowered hawthorns and for this very reason for pity on us both stand up and dry your tears 
believe me dear maid where i go you cannot come you tread the rough soldier's path why those pretty velvet buskins would wear out in the first march and turn those dainty hands to the rough craft of war to scouring harness and grooming chargers oh that were miserable indeed those cherry lips are worse suited than you know for the chance fare of camp and watchfire and these round arms would soon find a sword was heavier than a bodkin there again forget forgive and perhaps when i come back but why should i further follow that sad love scene under the broad spreading cedars let it be sufficient for you that i soothed her as well as might be and staunched her tears and modified my coolness taking her pretty hands and whispering to as dainty and greedy an ear as ever was open to hear perhaps a little more of lover friendliness than i truly meant and so we parted now see the shield turned that very afternoon did the other sister unbend a point with cruel suavity and set me joyous by promising to meet me at nightfall whereat as you will readily understand every other event of the day faded into nothingness at the appointed hour just as the white mist floated in thin fine wisps from the shadowed moat on the eastward of the castle wall and the red setting sun was throwing the strong black shadows of cedar branches upon the copper gleaming windows and walls of the side that faced him i rose and making some jesting excuse slipped away from my noisy comrades in the hall into the shadows of the corridors yes and though you may smile he who thought this phoenician had plumbed the well of mortal love to the very depth had learnt all there was to learn and left nothing that could stir him so much as a heart-beat in this fair field of adventure was now tripping through the ruddy and black dusk anxious and alert his pulses beating a quicker measure than his feet the native boldness of his nature all overlaid with new-born diffidence fingering his silken points as he went and conning pretty speeches now hoping in his lover hesitance the tryst would not be kept and then anon spurning himself for being so laggard and faint-hearted and thus progressing in moods and minds as many as the gentle shadows chequering his path from many an oriel window and many a fluted casement he came at length within sight of the deep-set window looking down over the pale shining water and the heavy woods beyond where his own love-tale was to be told and there as i plucked back the last tapestry that barred my passage and stood still for a moment on the threshold there before me sitting on the trestles under the mullions in the twilight was the figure of my fair and haughty english girl she had her face turned away from the evening glow her ample white cap peaked and laced with gold on either crescent point further threw into shadow the features i knew so well while the fine shapely hands lay hidden in the folds of the ample dress which shone and glimmered in the dusk against the oak panellings of that ancient lobby in misty uncertainty gentle dame my heart bounded with expectant triumph to see how pensive and downcast was her look how still she sat and how methought the white linen and the golden sanctuary above her heart rose and fell even in that silent place with the tumult of maidenly passion within my heart opened to her i say as though i were an enamoured shepherd about to pour a brand new virgin love into the frightened ears of some timid country maid and within my veins as the heavy arras fell from my hands behind me there surged up the molten stream of eastern love i waited neither to see nor hear else but strode swiftly over the floor and cast myself down there at her feet upon one knee gods how it makes me smart to think of it i who had never bent a knee before in supplication to earth or heaven and poured out before her the offering of my passion hot and swiftly i wooed her saying i scarce know what loosening my heart before that silent shrine laying bare the keen strong throb of life and yearning that pulsed within me persuading entreating cajoling until both breath and fancy failed and never under all that stream of love had the damsel given one sign one single indication of existence 
then on i went again deeming the maid held herself not yet wooed enough disporting myself before her and pleading the simplicity of my love saying how that if it brought no great riches with it yet was it the treasure of a truthful heart did she sigh to widen her father's broad lands i swore by osiris i would do it for her love better than any petty lordling could did she desire to shine honoured above all women where spears were broken or feasts were spread think of yon littered lists i cried and told her there was not a champion in all the world i feared none who should not come humbled to her footstool while as for honour and recognition jove i would pluck them from the king himself even as i had plucked them from his betters yet never a sign that fair girl gave full of wonder and surprise i waited for a moment for some sign or show if not of answering fire at least of reason and then as i checked in full course my passionate pleadings that wretched thing before me burst not into the tears i expected of maidenly capitulation nor into the proud anger of offended virgins but into a silly plebeian simper which began in ludicrous smothered merriment under the folds of the lawn she held across her face and ended amid what appeared contending feelings in a rustic outburst of sobs and exclamations i was on my feet in an instant all my wild love-making dammed back upon my heart by suspicion and surprise and as i frowned fiercely at that dim seen form under the distorting shadow of the windows it rose to nothing like alianora's height and stepped out where the evening light better illuminated us and there that poor traitress tore off in anger and remorse the lace and linen of a well-born english maiden and stood revealed before me the humblest the meanest seeming and the most despised kitchen wench of any that served in that baronial hall you will guess what my feelings were as this indignity i had been put to rushed upon me how in my wounded pride i crossed my arms savagely upon my breast and turned away from that poor simpering rustic fool and clenched my teeth and swore fierce oaths against that cruel girl who in her pride and insolence had played me this sorry trick wild and bitter were the gusts of passion that swept through my heart and all the more unruly since it was by and for a woman i had fallen and there was none for me to take vengeance on in a few minutes i turned to the wretched tool of a vixen mistress hast any explanation of this i sternly asked pointing to the disordered finery that lay glimmering upon the floor the unhappy kitchen-maid nodded behind her tears and the thick red hands wherewith she was streaking two wet round cheeks with alternate hues of grief and dinginess and put a hand into her bosom and handed me a folded missive i tore it open and read in prettily scrawled old norman french that cruel message this is to tell that nameless knight who has nothing to distinguish him but presumption that although the daughter of an english peer must ever treat his suit with the contempt it deserves yet will she go so far as to select him from among her father's vassals one to whom she thinks he might very fitly unburden his soul of its load of love and fealty such was the missive one surely penned by as ungentle a hand as ever ministered to a woman's heart i tore it into a hundred fragments and then grimly pointed my traducer to the narrow wicket in the remote wall leading down by a hundred stony stairs to the scullion places when she had come she turned and went a little way towards it then came sobbing back and burst out into grief anew and alas alas sir she cried this is the very worst task that ever i was put to shame upon lady eleonora and double shame upon me for doing her behests i am sorry sir indeed i am until you began that wonderful tale i thought was but a merry game but oh sir to see you there upon your knee to see your eyes burning in the dark with true love for my false mistress why sir it would have drawn tears from the hardest stone in the mill down yonder and ever as your talk went on just now i kept saying to myself sure but it must be a big heart which works a tongue like that and when you had done sir ah 
before you were half way throughs, though I could not stop you, yet I loathed my errand. I am sorry, sir, indeed I am. I cannot go until I be forgiven. There, there, silly girl, I said, my wrath quenched by her red eyes and humble amendments. You are fully absolved. She kissed my hands and dried her eyes, and swept together with woman swiftness the tattered things in which she had masqueraded, and then, as she was about to leave, I called her back. Stay one moment, damsel. How much had you for thus betraying me? Two zequins, sir, she answered with simplicity. Why, then here's three others to say naught about this evening's doings in the servants' hall. You understand? There, go, and no more tears or thanks. And as the curtain fell upon her, I could not help muttering to myself, What, two zequins to undo you, Fra, and three to mend it? Why, Phoenician, thou hast not been so cheap for thirteen hundred years. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Grim and angry, all that night I chewed the bitter cud of my rejection, and before the new day was an hour old, determined life was no longer worth the living in that place. I determined to leave those walls at once, to leave all my songs unsung, my trysts unkept to leave all my jolly comrades, the tilt-yards and banquets, but I could not do this so secret as I would. The very paying off of my score down in the buttery, the dismissing of my attendants, each with largesse, the seriousness I could not but give to my morning salutation of some of those I should never see again, betrayed me. And thus a whisper, first down the vaulted guard-room, and then a rumour, and anon, a widening murmur, the news was spread, until surely the very jackdaws on the battlements were saying to themselves, Fra is going, Fra, Fra is going. Yes, and the tidings spread to that fair floor of a hundred corridors, where the Norman arched windows looked down fourscore feet upon the river, winding amid its shining morning meadows, bringing a sigh to more than one silken pillow. It reached the unhappy red-eyed Isabel, and presently she tripped down the twining stone staircase, the loose folds of her skirt thrown over her arm to free her pretty feet, and in her hand a scrap of writing, a cartel, she called it, seemingly newly opened. She came to the sunny empty corridor where I stood alone, and touched me on the arm as I watched from a lattice, my charger being armed and saddled in the courtyard underneath and when I turned, held out her hand to me in frank and simple fashion. How could I refuse the proffer of so fair a friendship? And pulling my velvet cap from my head, I put her white fingers to my lips. And was it true? she asked with a sigh. I was really going that morning, and so suddenly. Only too true, I answered, and, saving her presence, not so sudden as my inclination prompted, much as I saw she wished to question the why and wherefore, but of this, as of nothing touching her stern sister, would I tell her. So presently she came to her point, and fingering that scroll she had, very downcast and blushful, said, You're a good knight, Sir Stranger, and strong and experienced in arms. Your ladyship's description wakes my ambition to deserve your words. And generous I have noticed, and as indulgent to page and squire of tender years as you are the contrary to stronger folk and if this were so madam i asked what then oh only she said wondrous shy and frightened that i have here a cartel from a friend of mine a youth of noble family who has heard of thee and would go to the wars in your company as your comrade i mean that is if you would take him why damsel the wars are free to every one but I am in no mood just now to tutor a young gallant in slitting Frenchman's throats. But this one, sir, very particularly wishes to travel with you, of whose prowess he is so convinced. He has, alas, quarrelled with those at whose side he should most naturally ride. He will be no trouble. For my sake you must take him. And, 
said the cunning girl standing on tiptoe to be the nearer my ear he is rich though friendless by a rash love he will gladly see to both your horses and disperse your passage over to france even for the honour of remembering that he did it now this touched me very nearly one by one my rings had gone and that morning after paying scores and largesse in truth i had found my wallet completely empty once again if this youth had money even though it were but sufficient to buy corn for our charges on the way and pay the ferry over to yonder fair field of adventure why there was no denying he would be a very convenient travelling companion and it would go hard but that i could teach him something in return thinking this i lifted my eyes and found those of isabel watching the workings of my face with pretty cunning in truth maid if thy friend has so much gold as would safely land us with king edward in flanders why i must confess that just at present that does greatly commend him to me what sort of a man is he the question seemed to overwhelm the lady who blushed and hung her head like a poppy that has stood a week's drought in truth sir she murmured i do not know not know but you said he was your friend oh so i did and now i come to think of it he is a tall youth about my size and make gads but he will be a shapely if somewhat sapling gallant i laughed letting my eye roam over the supple maiden figure before me but though he be so slim the girl hastened to add as if she feared that she had been indiscreet you will find the youth a rare good horseman and clever in many things he can cook if thou art ever belated like a frenchman and can read missals to thee and write like a monk thy comrades to-night will be one in a thousand he can sing like a mavis on a fir-top i like not these singing knights fair maid their verses are both too smooth for soldier ears and too licentious for maidens ah but my friend quoth isabel with a blush never sang an ungentle song in his life you will find him a most civil most simple-spoken companion very well i will have him no doubt we shall grow as close together as boone's companions should would that you might grow so close together as i could wish said the english girl with a sigh i did not understand and now how am i to know this friend i asked this slim and gentle youth what is his name and what is face i had near forgotten that and it was like a woman for they say they ever keep the most important matter to the last this boy for good reasons that i know but may not mention has sworn a vow after the fashion of the chivalry he delights in not to show his face not to wear his honourable name until some happier time shall come for him he is in love like many another and does conceive his heart to be most desperately consumed thereby wherefore he has taken the name of flamaucour and bears upon his shield a device to that effect this alone will point him out to you over and above the dropped visor which no earthly power will make him lift until this war and quest of his be over but you will know him i feel in my heart without consideration sir knight you will know this youth when you meet him something in my innermost heart does tell me even as i should know one that i loved or loved me behind twenty thicknesses of steel and now good-bye until we meet again the fair maid gave me her hand as though to part and then hesitated a moment presently she mustered up courage and said thou bearest me no ill-will for yonder wild meeting of ours maiden it is forgotten well let it be so i do not know what possessed me i was hurried down the stream of feeling like a leaf on a tide twas i that met thee there by the cedars and yet it was not me something so wild and fierce such a hot intruder spirit burnt within this poor circumference that i think i was damnate and bewitched thou dost most clearly understand that this hot fit is over now i clearly understand and that i love thee no longer quoth the lady with a sigh or at least not near so much madam so i conceive it be at ease it is sacred between us two and i will forget thanks a thousand thanks even for the relief that cold forgetfulness does give me and now again good-bye be gentle to flamaucour and and burst out the poor girl as her control forsook her if there is an eye in the whole of wide heaven 
oh may it watch thee if ever prayers of mine can pierce to the seat of the eternal oh may they profit thee gods that my wishes were iron bars for thy dear body and my salt tears could but rivet them good-bye good-bye and kissing my hands in a fierce outburst of weeping that fair white girl turned and fled and disappeared through the tapestries that screened the norman archways before nightfall i was down by the english coast and many a long league from the castle thoughtful and alone my partings made i had paced out from its gloomy archway the gay feathers on my helmet top near brushing the iron teeth of the portcullis lowering above and my charger's hoofs falling as hollow on the echoing drawbridge as my heart beat empty to the sounds of happy life behind me away south went the pathway trodden day after day by contingents of gallant troops from that nightly stronghold jove one might have followed it at midnight those jolly bands had made a trail through copse and green wood through hamlet and through heather like the track of a storm wind they had beaten down grass and herbage they had robbed orchards and spinneys and here their wayside fires were still a smouldering and their waved rags upon the bushes and broken shreds and baggage now and then as i paced along i saw in the hamlets the folk still looking southwards and standing gossiping on the week's wonders the boys meanwhile careering in mock onset with broken spear shafts or discarded trappings oh twas easy enough to know which way my friends had gone so plain was the track and so well did my good horse acknowledge it that there was little for me to do but sit and chew the bitter cud of fancy all through the hot afternoon all through the bright sunshine and shining green bracken did we saunter back towards the grey sea i knew so well back towards that void beginning of my wanderings and as my sad thoughts turned to when i last had sat a charger in such woods as these to my fair saxon homestead editha the abbey and its abbot my donning english mail and breaking spears for a smile from yon cold peeress with much more of like nature went idly flitting through my head but hardly a thought among all that motley crowd was there for isabel or her tears and my promised meeting with her playmate thus it happened that as evening fell and found me still some two miles from where our troops lay camped along the shore waiting to-morrow's ferrying across to france i rode down the steep bank of a small river to a ford and slowly waded through there be episodes of action that live in our minds and incidents of repose that recur with no less force so then that placid evening stream has come before me again and again in the hot tumult of onset and melee in court and camp in the cold of winter and in summer's warmth i have ridden that ford once more i have gone down sad and thoughtful as i did my loose reins on my charger's arching neck watching the purple shine of the water where it fretted and broke in the evening light against his fetlocks again and again i have listened to the soft lisp of the stream as he drank of that limpid trough and i have seen in its cool fresh mirror my own tall image my waving crimson plumes and the one white star of the evening above reflected upon it and yet if these things of a remote yesterday are fresh in my mind even more so is my meeting with the slim gallant whose figure rose before me as i emerged from the ford as my good english charger bore me up from the hollow on the brow of the opposite rise was a mounted figure standing out clear and motionless against the yellow glow of the sunset at first i thought it would be some wandering spearman bound on a like errand with myself for more than one or two such had passed that day but something in the steadfast interest of that silent horseman roused my curiosity even before i was near enough to see the colour of his armour or the device upon his shield up we scrambled up that sandy heathery scar the strong sinews of my war-horse playing like steel cordage under my thighs as he lifted me and my armour up the gravelly path and then as we topped the rise and came into the evening breeze that strange warrior advanced and held out a hand 
never in all my experience had i known a knight extend the palm of friendship to another so demure and downcast truth i thought to myself this friend of isabel's is in fact as she said the most modest mannered soldier who ever took a place in the rough game of war but i was pledged to like him and therefore in the most hearty manner possible as we came up knee to knee i slapped my heavy hand into his extended fingers and welcomed him loudly as a long-looked-for comrade and in truth he was a very pretty fellow whose gentle presence grew upon me after that first meeting each hour we lived together he seemed as far as i could judge no more than five-and-twenty years of age yet even that was but a guess for his armour was complete from top to toe his visor was down and there was indeed naught to judge by but a certain slightness of limb and suppleness that spoke of no more mature years in height this gallant was very passable enough and his helmet with its nodding plumes added some grace and inches to his stature while his pale grey mail was beautifully fashioned and moulded and spoke through every close joint and cunning finished link of a young but well-proportioned soldier the arms this warrior carried were better suited to his strength than to that of the man who rode beside him his lance was long and of polished inlay while mine beside it was like the spear of goliath to a fisher's hazel wand his dagger was better for cutting the love-knot on a budget of sonnets than for disburdening foemen's spirits of their mortal shackles his cross-hilted sword was so light it made me sigh to look at it on his shield was a heart wrapped in flames most cunningly painted and expressive enough in those days when every man took a pride in being as vulnerable to women as he was unapproachable among men but who am i that i should judge that gentle knight by myself by me whose sinews countless fights have but matured who have been blessed by the gods with bulk and strength above other mortals why should i measure his brand new lance gleaming in the pride of virgin polish against the stern long spear i carried or that dainty brand of his that mayhap his tender maid had belted on him for the first time some hours before with such a broad blade as long use had made lighter to my hand than a lady's distaff before we had paced a mile flamaucoeur had proved himself the sprightliest companion who ever enlivened a dull road with wit and laughter at first was i that spoke for he had not one word in all the world to say he was so shy but when i twitted him for this and laughed and asked him of his lady-love and how she had stood the parting how many tears there had been and whether they all were hers and whose heart was that upon his shield his own or the damsel's and so on in bantering playfulness i got down to the mettle of that silent boy he winced beneath my laughter for a little time and fidgeted upon his saddle and then the gentle blood in his veins answered as i hoped it would and he turned and gave me better than i offered such a pretty fellow in wordy fence i never saw his tongue was like a woman's it was so hard to silence when i thought i had him at disadvantage on a jest he burked the point of my telling argument and struck me below my guard when i would have pinned him to some keen inquiry regarding that which he did not wish to tell he turned questioner with swift adroitness and made quicker than it takes to write his inquisitor the humble answerer to his playful malice he was better at that fence than i there could be no doubt and very speedily his nimble tongue which sounded so strange and pleasant in the hollow of his helmet had completely mastered mine so with a laugh i did acknowledge to the conquest whereon that generous youth was pleased i saw and laid aside his coyness and chattered like a mill-stream among the gravels on an idle sunday he turned out both shrewd and witty with a head stuffed full of romance and legend just as one might have who had spent a young life listening to troubadours and minstrels and i liked him none the less because he trimmed the gross fables of that time to such a decent shape he told me one or two that i had heard before although he knew it not and as i had heard them from the licentious lips of courtly minstrels they are not fit to write or tell 
but my worthy wayfarer clipped and purged them so adroitly and turned them out so fair and seemly all with such a nice unconsciousness i scarce could recognise them he was a most gentle-natured youth and there was something in his presence something in the half frankness he put forth and something in that there was strange about him which greatly drew me now you would think to listen to him he was all a babbling stream as shallow as could be and then anon a turn of sad wisdom or a sigh set you wondering as when that same stream runs deep into the shadows and you hear it fret and fume with gathering strength far away in unknown depths of mother earth a most enticing a most perplexing comrade beguiling the way in this fashion and liking my new ally better and better as we went we came a little after nightfall on a wet and windy evening to the hamlet near the sea where the rearguard of the english troops were collected for ferrying over to france here we halted and sought food and shelter but neither were to be had for the asking that little street of english dwellings was crowded with hungry troopers they were camping by their gleaming watch-fires all along the grassy ways so full was every lodgment while every yellow window of the dim gabled alehouse in the midst shone into the wet dark night and every room within was replete with stamping clanking noisy gallants their chargers filled the yard and were picketed a furlong down the muddy road that sloped to the murmuring unseen sea and there was not space it seemed for one single other horse or rider in the whole friendly village but the insidious flamoqueur found a way and place he sought out the master of the inn himself and unheeding of his curt refusals made requests so cunning and used his money pouch so liberal that the strong and surly yeoman with much to do found us a loft to sleep in which was a bedroom better than the wayside though still but a rough one then flamoqueur waylaid the buxom hurrying housewife and on an evening when many a good gentleman was going supperless to bed got us a loaf of white bread and a wooden bowl of milk the which we presently shared most comrade-like my friend lifting his visor so much as might suffice to eat but yet not enough to show his face he waylaid a lad and for a coin or two and a little of his sweet-voiced cajoling got our steeds watered and sheltered though many another lordly sleek-limbed beast stood all night unwashed unminded a most persuasive youth was flamoqueur and then our frugal supper made and our horses seen to we went to bed diffident ingenious young knight he made my couch while i was not by long and narrow no bigger than for one of all the soft things he could lay his hand on as though forsooth i were some tender flower and for himself hardly spread a horse-cloth on the bare floor now when i came up and found this done without a word i sent the boy to go and see what the night was like and if the moon yet showed or if it rained and when he went forthwith pulled that couch to bits respreading it so it was broad enough for two good comrades side by side ah and when flamoqueur came back i rated him soundly telling him that though it was set in the laws of arms that a young knight should show due deference to an older yet all that comrades had of hard or soft was equally dividable both board and bed and good luck and misfortune and he was amenable though still a little strange and unbuckled his armour by our dim rushlight and then poor tired youth with that iron mask upon his head in his quilted underwear threw himself upon the couch and slept almost before he could straighten out those shapely limbs of his and i presently lay down by his side and slept while all through my dreams went surging the wildest fancies of tilt and tawny and lady's love and now i heard in the uproar of the restless village street and the neighing of the chargers at their pickets the noise of battle and of onset and then i thought i had on some unknown field five thousand spearmen overset against an hundred times as many and while my heart bounded proudly in answer to that disadvantage and i rode up and down our glittering ranks speaking words of strength and courage to those scanty heroes 
waving my shining sword in the sun that shone for victory on us and curbing my fretting charger's restless valour methought somehow the words dried up upon my lips and the proud murmur of my firm-set veterans turned to a low moaning wail and a grey mist of tears put out the sun and black grief drank up the warriors and while i wrestled with that melancholy blodwin my princess was sitting by my side cooling my hot forehead with her calm immortal hand and calling me with smiling accent dull unwitful easily beguiled and all the time that young gallant by me lay limp supine asleep and soulless so passed the chequered fancies of the night and the earliest dawn found us up in arms and ready for sterner things again i had to owe to flamaucoeur's ready wit and liberal purse precedence for our needs above all the requirements of the many good knights who would have crossed with the haste they could but had perforce to wait it was he who got us a vessel sufficient for our needs when the fisher folk were swearing there was not a ship to be hired for twenty miles up or down the coast in this we embarked with our horses and one or two other gentlemen we knew and in a few hours sailing the english shore went down and the sunny cliffs of normandy rose ahead of us will you doubt but that i stood thoughtful and silent as the green and silver waves were shivered by our dancing prow and that strange familiar land rose up before us i that british i who had seen caesar's galleys heavy with umbrian and etrurian put out from that very shore i who had stood on the green cliffs of harold's kingdom and shaken a saxon javelin towards that home of norman tyranny i this knightly steel-bound i stood and watched that country grow upon us with thoughts locked in my heart there were none to listen to and none to share oh it was passing strange and i did not rouse me until our iron keel went gently riding up the norman gravel and our vessel was beached upon the hostile shore end of chapter twelve